Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens. Let's talk gardens. Our webinar series is here to introduce you to many topics. Sometimes we try to make your thumb a little bit greener. In this case, we're going to try to have introduce you to who else is sharing your garden, your landscape. And Frederic Lavapierre is going to join us and talk about a subject that she just finished writing a book on. So she'll tell you more about that. But first, my name is Cindy Brown. I am the Collections and Education Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and it is my pleasure to greet you every week and introduce you to these wonderful discussions. So if you have a question during today's presentation, please put it in the chat box, and then I will ask Frederic when the presentation is finished, and we'll have a little discussion. So without further ado, Frederic, would you take us over? I'll disappear, and you're going to tell us more about yourself, your project, and the topic of your book. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be back in just a bit. Thank you so much for your invitation to present today. I'm really excited about this. And um, I get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, life in the garden, uh, something I've always been interested in. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I, I studied horticulture in college. That's when I really started to garden. And I um, then moved on and got a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies. It was garden ecology and communications and went on to a master's in biology, studying plant insect interactions. And during that time, I started to write for Pacific Horticulture Magazine, and it was a quarterly, um, a series called Garden Allies. And I wrote that series for 10 years. And when I stopped working at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which you will hear about in this presentation, I um, thought, well, it's time to compile all of these articles. And I added additional essays and introductory material and um, revised everything. So. Um, I am ready to get started now with my actual talk. Um, the photos, some of them have, are mine. Some of them I have permissions for. Others are from Creative Commons. So you know that story about putting the frog in the pot of cold water and it slowly warms up. Well, I'm throwing you into the hot water and my first dozen slides are uh, pretty science-based. They're quite texty. And then after that, we move on to some stories which may or may not be in the book. And I will introduce you to some of my favorite organisms out in the garden. So when you hear the term garden allies, most of us think of pollinators. And of course, pollinators are really important, but there are a lot of other things out there too, decomposers, nutrient facilitators, all kinds of specialized relationships between insects and plants. And we are gonna talk about a number of these. So I like to start, um, okay. I like to start by being able to put my, there, thank you. So conservation, biological control. What is it? Why does it matter? Um, perhaps most of you are familiar with integrated pest management, which was really devised for farming originally and for commercial enterprises and takes us all the way from the least harmful mechanical, physical, cultural controls and biological control um, all the way through this decision-making to be able to use conventional pesticides if necessary. But we are gonna take a closer look at biological control. And you can see that it's divided into three types, classical, augmentative, and conservation biological control. So I am very briefly going to tell you about these things. But one thing I like to point out is that our um, cost benefit analysis is really not an economic threshold like a farmer would use, but an aesthetic threshold. And that's really what gardeners for the most part are doing. So classical biological control is this introduction and establishing of a natural enemy of an introduced pest that's native to the same region as that pest. 
And this uh, handsome gentleman here, Charles Valentine Riley, Riley, excuse me, considered to be the father of biological control in the United States. In the very late 1800s, the citrus industry in California had this horrible insect come in, the cottony cushion scale. It is um, Isiria perchassii, and um, it completely was decimating the citrus trees. And so Charles decided, what should we do? I'm going to go to Australia where this insect came from and see if there's anything that attacks it. And he came back with this Vidalia beetle, which is a type of coccinella D, um, a ladybug, and a parasitic wasp. And it was tremendously successful. He saved the citrus industry. And he, what we discovered subsequently is that, yes, this provides long-term control, but only in perennial systems, such as an orchard. And um, later on, we found it can be very expensive because something Charles didn't worry about when he brought these things back is, well, what can happen after these insects have eaten this pest? Or are they going to switch to eating something that we would like? And this is especially important when we're talking about um, weed control, where we introduce an insect to control a weed and perhaps don't want it then to start eating something that we value. That's usually what we're thinking about when we're thinking about biological control. And if not that, we're thinking about augmentative, um, where we are artificially supplementing natural enemies, ladybugs being the most common uh, thing that we think of in here. But it can be expensive. And there's two basic strategies, and both of them providing only temporary control. So we might have adults that we're releasing at the beginning of a season, and the control is by the offspring or inundation, which is really using an insect like a biopesticide and expecting an immediate reduction. And we will talk a little more about ladybugs a bit later on. But let's move on here to conservation biological control, which I use and have for years. It is the preservation and enhancement of our existing natural enemies. So some of those have been introduced and they're of great value, some of the parasitic wasps that control cabbage aphids, for instance. Um, and this is really the only approach that creates a positive feedback loop. So we have two major strategies. We reduce pesticides so that we can increase populations of these beneficial insects, and we provide resources, food, water, shelter for the insects that we want. Um, and here you will see um, the late green lacewing eggs on the left. This is family Chrysopidae. Um, and that's followed by a lady beetle and the coccinellidae. And that is a lacewing larva here in the third photograph. And then we have a ladybug larva. And one of the things about beneficial insects like this, these predators and parasitoids, is that um, they often are only effective in one stage of their life cycle. So with the lacewings, for instance, only the larva is a predator. The ladybugs, though, like some other wonderful insects, are predatory in both their adult and their larval stage. So there's a lot of ecosystem benefits to conservation biological control, and you can see them listed here. Today, we're really focusing more on the pest regulation and a little bit on pollination, but you can see that what this will lead to is less pesticide, less runoff in our neighborhoods, in our backyards, in our creeks. Um, and I think this is something that we're all trying to do at this point. I wanna talk for a moment about native plants. Um, this is the meadow at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden where I've worked. Uh, it's an all native plant botanic garden. And um, these are plants from the California Floristic Province. So it includes a little bit of Baja, Mexico, and um, a little bit of Oregon. So I'm a big fan of native plants, and um, it's because they're supporting ecosystem health and habitat. And I'm not a purist about this. If hydrangeas remind you of your grandmother, please grow them, even if they're not native, even if they don't really provide habitat. Um, gardens are habitat for us too. But on to coevolution, 
So this term came up in the 60s. And actually, some obscure mathematician originally came up with it. But we always think of Paul Ehrlich, an entomologist, and Peter Raven, a botanist, when we think of this. And their seminal paper about this was called Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution. And probably they should have called it Caterpillars and Plants, but not as many people would be reading this. This is really about the close relationship between the speciation of butterfly species and their associated plant species. So we know caterpillars generally eat a very restricted range of plants that are related. And of course, the familiar example to most of us now is Donus plexippus, the monarch, feeding here on Asclepia speciosa, the showy milkweed. So the herbivorous insect is eating the plant. And those that are tolerating the plant, the toxins in the plant survive. And then the insect species evolves to continue feeding on the plant. The plant gets more toxic and we're off to the evolutionary arms race. So that leads to speciation, and it also leads to specialization. So bees, for instance, a lot of our native bees are specialists on only certain flowers. Yes, they're feeding on plants, um, just not in the same way as the ones that are eating the leaves. Um, uh, most herbivorous insects, it turns out, are more or less linked with certain plant species with which they evolved, their native species. Um, and many predators and parasitoids are also more or less specialists. The bottom line is that native plants are simply better for biodiversity. So the most compelling reason to grow native plants is because herbivorous insects rely on them. And that can be hard to articulate uh, why it's important to, especially to gardeners, landscapers, homeowners. Um, so I say, well, take a look at this beautiful pipe vine swallowtail here, Batis philanor. It eats only this pipe vine. You see the caterpillars here. We love these butterflies. And if we want them in our gardens, we need to welcome the caterpillars. So most herbivores are actually very good at hiding, unlike these black and red caterpillars that are advertising, I taste bad, don't mess with me. So let's take a look at this. Plants are converting the sun's energy to provide nutrients for all planetary life. And um, it all begins with the plants. So herbivorous insects actually account for um, 25 to 35% of all insects. And insects are half of all biodiversity on the planet. And that includes plants. So these herbivorous insects are converting the embodied plant energy for use by all these other creatures uh, because plants really are hard to digest for the most part. 90% of all herbivorous insect species are specialists and their essential role though in the food web is rarely discussed in horticulture. And I like to recommend Doug Tallamy's books too, which you are probably familiar with. Um, and he gets deeply into these reasons why we really need these herbivorous insects. So as a gardener, I wanna tell you, there are a lot of strategies we can use to welcome these insects and still have beautiful gardens. So maybe you don't like insects, um, that's okay, not everybody does, but you maybe you like birds. So it's important to know 96% of our terrestrial birds in North America feed their babies insects and other arthropods. 70% of them continue to eat arthropods at least as part of their diet as adults. And half of their diet is Lepidoptera, and as we just noted, caterpillars need particular plants, often natives. Okay. So birds actually are providing $16 trillion of ecosystem services a year worldwide in pest control. And one of the reasons why our bird populations have gone down so much in the past decades is a lot of it has to do with our use of pesticides and that we are killing a lot of what these birds are relying on for food. So it's all connected, right? You, you, you tug a little thread and it reverberates throughout this web. And so we wanna promote biodiversity, right? We want more biodiversity. Everybody's always talking about like biodiversity is good, but what is that really? Do we 
No, let's take a closer look. So these here are a couple of our California uh, native wildflowers, Leia platyglossa and um, Nemophila menziesii, better known as baby blue eyes and tidy tips. And a lot of wildflowers everywhere around the country, especially our early season ones, provide great pollen and nectar uh, for a lot of insects we want to attract. So let's begin here with what we're usually thinking of when we think biodiversity. We're thinking about the number of species present. We want more species. And generally speaking, the higher the number of plant species, the higher the number of arthropod species we will find there. But we also want to take into account abundance, how many individuals of each species are present. If you have 100 species in your garden, but you only have one individual of 99 species and thousands of your 100 species, that is not going to create a good situation in your garden. So abundance is more important than richness alone. But here's something else to consider. And by the way, this is a ladybug pupa here. It's not just the richness and the abundance that matters but it's the identity of these different species in your ecosystem and what role they are playing. And it leads us to something we think of as insurance species that provide high functional group biodiversity. And the uh, example I like to use is the aphid eating biological guilt, which is really what we're talking about here with these groups. And a lot of things eat aphids. Um, insects, maybe spiders, hummingbirds like to feed them to their babies. And what happens is that if one of these organisms, say you had a dozen species of ladybugs and they all eat aphids, um, the ones that you have in your garden there. And um, if one of them dies because of a pathogen or some other ladybug catastrophe, there are others that can step in and fill that role. And that leads to your system being resilient and the ability of that system to reorganize following a disturbance. And it leads to higher functional group biodiversity that leads to higher resilience and your garden bounces back. And we are always, of course, disturbing our gardens when we're gardening. So there's a lot of factors that are promoting biodiversity in our gardens. And I've listed a number of them here. And you'll notice that all of these are features of gardens. It is harder to implement conservation biological control in a farming environment. Small farms with really diverse crops can do it, but if you have a large monoculture, it is going to be difficult to do this. Um, more farms are putting in hedgerows and beetle banks and other such things to help out. But this is easy to implement in a garden. So I wanna take a look for a moment at how insects are feeding on plants. Pollinators I mentioned are feeding on plants. Uh, this is a native sunflower bee on the left in the family Megachilidae. And um, in the middle, we have a bee fly, family Bombyliidae. And you can see its proboscis is going way down into that tube there. And on the right is a tiny little surfid fly, family Surfidae. And it is on Matricaria chamomila, which is our common German chamomile. You can see how small those flowers are and we need to provide small flowers for small insects. And as you may know, um, the Asteraceae, the composite family is a head of flowers. So these are all tiny little flowers that these insects are visiting. This is usually what we're thinking about when we think, oh, insects feeding on plants. Um, and um, here are some caterpillars. They're gonna turn into beautiful swallowtails. It was actually difficult for me to even find these. They were doing very little damage to the madrone tree on which they were found. And a lot of caterpillars feed at night and during the day they will come, this is what this caterpillar is doing here, lining itself up with the mid vein on the leaf on the underneath, um, a good place to look for them. And so here, what we're seeing is a leaf cutting bee on the right. Um, and so it's not actually eating the flower, it's cutting these little ovals and lining its tunnels with them. So is this a beneficial insect? Is it a pest? I get phone calls from people saying, my, my red bud is being eaten up. Uh, and I like to say, maybe it's just plant lace. Um, so let's look at this 
issue here of what is a pest or beneficial. The longer I do this, the more I try and use the terms prey, predators, decomposers, and not pest or beneficial, which is really a human construct largely, whether something is a pest or a beneficial. And, and this is the most common question I get. How do I tell the good guys from the bad guys? Not always so easy. This larva on the left is a surfeit fly larva, and it's going to eat a lot of aphids in its lifetime. But you might be tempted to squish it if you didn't know better. It looks like a little slug or something. Um, on the far right, this is a little geometric packet that a little moth caterpillar, I think, makes out of these bay leaves. No one ever notices them. I do because I'm looking at tiny little things, and I think these are beautiful. In the middle, we have a spider, and it has caught what looks like a small fly. Is that fly a predator or a parasitoid on insects we don't want? I'm not sure. Is it a pest fly? I'm not positive. The spider is gonna eat the fly. Is the spider beneficial? Maybe the spider is gonna get eaten by a bird. So, um, you know, I try and think about these things as I'm in my garden. And also that some things may be pests in one stage of life, some caterpillars, and yet turn into something we love, butterflies. So in this next section here, um, those were all the wordy uh, um, slides with all the science in them uh, for the most part. Um, I am loosely following the structure of my book here with there's um, seven chapters in it. And I always start with soil, life between beneath our feet. So before I get going, introducing you to things, I'm gonna say, you know, you probably are already familiar with what most orders of insects are, depending on who's counting, you know, there's 17, to you know, 25 or so orders of insects. And so you recognize them though as you know, the Hymenoptera or the bees and wasps and butterflies or the Lepidoptera and beetles or the Coleoptera. <clears throat> so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. Um, <clears throat> so this is a sand wasp. It's a Bembix species. It's a solitary brown nesting wasp. If you're going to notice that I'm going to give you some stories here. If you actually have my book, you may know that some of these stories aren't in the book um, and just came up as I was preparing this. So when you think about the air in which plants are extending their stems and leaves and fruit, it really is a virtual desert unless you can fly. But the soil into which roots are extending their roots is... <clears throat> providing anchorage and water and nourishment. And every single surface in the soil is teeming with life. Even that little film of, of water that is lining everything is full of microorganisms. So you may not see much life in the soil because a lot of it is invisible. But if it isn't there, if your soil is depauperate, you will be able to tell um, because it will look sort of lifeless. Um, so we're going to meet just a few of the denizens of the soil. Um, and as I said, a lot of this life is microscopic. This scary looking creature on the right, a pseudoscorpion, is really tiny. Most of you may never have seen one. Um, and I actually think they're kind of cute and they won't hurt you. Um, and on the left here is a springtail. This is a globular springtail. Tail. They're very tiny. Um, when you get a lot of them, you may notice them bouncing about. Um, <clears throat> this photograph, um, this drawing here comes from a book, Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners by Jim Nardi. It is a fantastic book if you are interested in soil and how it is formed and everything that lives there. So we are going to take a look at earthworms briefly. This is an earthworm egg on the right. And over here on the left is an earthworm. It may surprise you to know that a night crawler can produce up to 10 pounds of nutrient rich castings in a single year. So earthworms are clearly improving soil structure and drainage. They're accelerating decomposition. They're creating channels 
for roots, water, air, nutrients, and they are a big reason why um, I really favor no-till techniques as much as possible. So it might surprise you to learn that most earthworms are not native to North America and actually are creating issues in places like um, the forests in Michigan, um, where they are eating all the duff that the wildflowers rely on. And now we have a new non-native uh, worm called the jumping worm, a minthus species that is an issue in the upper Midwest and Northeast United States. They degrade soil quality, they eat all the organic matter, they create a loose seedbed, and they've even been observed feeding on the roots of young plants. <clears throat> so you're asked to report them. And I bring them up because although I like to think everything in the garden is an ally, it's not. Um, <clears throat> so decomposers and nutrient facilitators are sometimes the very same thing. Here we have some mushrooms and moss on a stump that are gradually degrading it. And on the right, we have some nodules that produce nitrogen. So this is a nitrogen fixing plant. And as these nodules come off, they degrade and provide nitrogen for subsequent plants or sometimes even for this one. So we don't really have time to go into all the extraordinary organisms that live in soil. And we're gonna move on and talk for a couple minutes about flower visitors. So there's a reason I didn't call this chapter pollinators because we do have, as I mentioned, a lot of organisms, insects mostly, that are visiting flowers that are not necessarily pollinators. So it might surprise you to learn that monarch butterflies are actually not very good pollinators. And when you observe them, you'll see them perch way up above the flower there and sticking their proboscis down. So this here is a helicted bee. It's a solitary um, ground nesting bee and it's nectaring on milkweed in this, in this um, drawing of Craig's. And um, let's, so let's talk about bees for a couple minutes, okay? Now, bees have an electrostatic charge that's only been recently discovered on their hair. So it's, it's like a, a pollen magnet. And um, they, so they've got branched hairs on, parts of their body and pollen just gets attracted to them. And they're also the only insects that are purposely collecting pollen and carrying it around. They are by far our best and most important pollinators. And we have over 4,000 species in the United States that are native here. Honeybees are not one of them. They are not native to the United States, although we rely on them for much of our pollination of agricultural crops. Everything else got pollinated by native bees and pretty much um, still does. So only females sting, by the way, and many, many bees are non-aggressive, they're solitary nesters, and their stings can't even penetrate human skin. On the left here, these are some male um, sunflower bees, Melisodes species, and the males have to sleep outside like this um, because only the females are um, building the nests. Um, on the right, I include this picture here because that's a very, very tiny bee on a milkweed flower. And a lot of us don't realize how very tiny a lot of these bees are. And in the middle here, um, I think this is a Lassia blossom species. It's a little native bee. And you can see it's covered with pollen. It's on a Western blue-eyed grass, Cisynrhynchium bellum. So I'm gonna move on to moths and butterflies. Um, butterflies are only 10% of our Lepidopteran flora. Um, and that's because we're not outside at night a lot and it's dark out there. We don't see all the moths. They're often kind of dull colored. Although we do have some moths that are day flying and brightly colored. On the right here is an American painted lady, Vanessa Virginiensis. And their larvae feed on plants in the Asteraceae. In the middle is a dusky wing, and on the left is a skipper. These are both in the Hesperiidae, which is kind of a link between moths and butterflies. And you can see the very long proboscis on the skipper, again, with the tubular flowers. Something butterflies are really good at is uh, tubular flowers, as long as there's a good place for them to land. <clears throat> 
So I included hunting wasps in um, my section on flower visitors because they feed on nectar as adults and they are preying on insects and spiders and a few other little organisms so that they can provision their nests. And they're paralyzing the prey, putting it into the nest. And when the larva eats that prey, they eat the non-vital parts first so that the prey stays alive and fresh. And um, this sphesid wasp here on the right is actually on a little pond and getting a drink of water. And this braconid on the left is um, nectaring. So we do see wasps on flowers. And by the same token, a lot of flies are found on flowers. And generally speaking, these are predators and parasitoids. This is a tachinid fly on the left, which is a parasitoid. And on the right is a surfeit fly again. And the surfeit fly, as I mentioned, only feeds on nectar as an adult and, um, it is, and pollen. All right, and um, the, it is the larvae that are eating pests. <clears throat> I include this fly because I simply love it. Um, so the story about this is that this flower here is the flower of the Epipactus gigantea, which is a California stream orchid. And this photo was sent to me by my friend, Philip Bansell, and he said, what kind of bee is this? Well, it's a fly. And I can tell because of those funny looking little antennae. And orchids have all kinds of cool pollination mechanisms. In this case, the serpent fly climbs in and the top um, petal here slaps down on the back of the serpent and deposits these sticky pollinia, which hold the pollen. And I don't even know how this poor fly is supposed to fly anymore because it looks loaded. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna dig just a little deeper into predators and parasites. Um, what is the difference? Let's start out here with this robber fly in the family Acility. In its lifetime, it will kill and eat many individuals and it is a predator. It is free living in both its adult and its larval stage. But what is the difference between a parasite and a parasitoid? A word that you, I'm sure you have heard before. Well, they both live on or inside a host. Okay. The difference is a parasite is usually far smaller than its host. It very rarely kills its comfortable abode because it is often bound to its host for life. So then it would die as well. A parasitoid though has a life cycle with a free living adult stage. And it could be much larger than the parasite. And um, it almost invariably kills its host. Okay. <clears throat> Um, parasitoids are almost always flies and wasps. There's a few exceptions that we're not gonna deal with. So among the flies, here's a tachinid fly again. They're often bristly. So when you see really bristly flies on your flowers, they are probably tachinids and they are not house flies. Um, and um, these are parasitic on um, a lot of different groups. They are one of our most valuable insects as an ally in the garden. The bombyliidae, the bee fly on the right, parasitizes mostly bees and wasps, but it's an important pollinator and um, nature is complicated. So let's take a look at the wasps here. Um, these are all braconids, um, as far as I know. I am not sure what this wasp on the right is doing. I just like that photograph. But the one in the middle here is depositing its, lar um, its eggs inside this caterpillar where the larva will subsequently develop. And our egg, larval, and pupal parasitoids. So some of those are among our tiniest allies. There are wasps that parasitize butterfly eggs. You can imagine how tiny that would be. And those are the most valuable because that egg is never gonna hatch. With caterpillars, of course, the caterpillar is never going to survive to reproduce, but some studies have shown some caterpillars actually eat more um, once they have been parasitized. And then the pupal parasitoids, it's the same thing. That generation then won't survive to reproduce again. Okay, on to beetles. Meet the beetles. This is an ornate checkered beetle in the family Clarity. It's Trichodes ornatus. And 
They are fairly conspicuous and brightly colored, and they are predaceous in both their larval and adult stages. A lot of them have very interesting flower histories, and a lot of these are flower visitors. So you see, I could have put them in the flower visitors, but instead I included them here with the beetles. And um, I wanna mention here, especially as we're entering fall, that a lot of beetles love late summer bloomers with small flowers and clusters like goldenrod and yarrow. And they like early blooming grasses in the spring uh, from which they get pollen and sometimes shelter at the base. And so we're just gonna look at a small selection of beetles today. I said we'd talk about lady beetles, please don't buy them. Um, they are actually a migratory insect. Um, they are not very effective when you release them in your garden, but you can attract dozens of species of lady beetles. And they don't all attack aphids. For instance, this here is the adult and larva of the mealybug destroyer, Cryptolamus montrusieri. So, they don't always look attractive either. In fact, um, the Lotus Land, which is a garden out in California, has had a big issue. Really, their issue is with mealybugs. But what they see down at ground level on um, palm leaves is hordes and hordes of these larvae that look like mealybugs, and they're all climbing up the tree. Um, and so, you know, they often are tempted to spray them because they're not very attractive. Um, I think that we just need a sign that says, here's what these guys are doing. Okay. Soldier beetles are in the family Cantharidae on the left and they're related to blister beetles and fireflies and can be mistaken for either of those things. They are a great garden ally and they pupate in leaf litter. And so you don't hear about these in farming but they're actually a fantastic ally. Um, they are frequently flower visitors and the larvae are found in soil and they prey as adult and larvae on all kinds of things, aphids, caterpillars, grasshopper eggs, mites, small insects. They're reputed to eat cucumber beetle eggs, so they're heroes in my book. So the predaceous ground beetle. The predaceous ground beetle is um, nocturnal. They're quick. They're dark colored, we tend not to see them, but they actually are one of our largest family of beetles. They hunt caterpillars, beetle grubs, grasshoppers, and there are some species that even hunt snails and slugs, and they can eat their weight in prey daily. And you can see the giant mandibles on this guy. That's one of the differences between um, these carabid beetles and darkling beetles, which are tenebrionidae. Darkling beetles are herbivorous, and they can look very similar. And there are some physical features that help us tell them apart, but mainly I do this on behavior. The, um, the darkling beetles are herbivorous, they move slower, and these guys run, um, the carapids. Well, here is a leaf-eating beetle, and we would usually think, eh, I don't really want these in my yard, okay? But this right here, um, and leaf beetles are all in the family Chrysomelidae. This one is Chrysolina quadrigemina. It is a Klamath weed beetle and it attacks Klamath weed, Hypericum perforatum, which is a toxic weed, an introduced weed of rangelands. So um, we also have some weevils that we use for um, <clears throat> weed management. So we're gonna go on to the garden commons. So this is sort of the, the, the section in which I put everything that I didn't know quite where to put it. And you're seeing this drawing again because it's simply one of my favorites out of a, over 150 drawings in the book. So this will include our true bugs, lace wings, dragonflies, mantises. And um, so let's talk for a moment, what's a bug? Okay. I know we use this word to describe any kind of creepy crawly and even roly polies, which are actually crustaceans, um, not even an insect. But a true bug is one kind of insect that has piercing sucking mouth parts. This one is the jagged ambush bug, Phimata species. And here are some other true bugs. They are in the order Hemiptera. And many of them are plant feeders. And we see this aposematic 
coloring again, the red and black that says, I don't taste good. And on the herbivorous species on the right, you can see its mouth part is um, lined up right underneath its abdomen. And on the left, we see the mouth part stuck into this poor insect that it caught. So we have herbivorous species and we have um, predatory species. But the thing to remember is they're all a good food source for many other members of the food web. Sometimes you can tell by sheer numbers if something is a predator because there will be fewer of them than their prey. Um, and I tend not to worry about anything in my garden if I only see a few of something. But then we have these homopteran groups, which we later found out are actually not closely related, but as gardeners, it's convenient to still group them because these include our biggest problems. Um, aphids, scale insects, white flies, mealybugs, um, and even though they can be quite cute, like this little leaf hopper nymph on the left with the wax filaments shooting out its bottom, um, we don't always welcome these. And we look to ladybugs to protect um, our plants to some degree by eating aphids. But you can see this interaction happening here where this ant is going towards the ladybug and ready to attack it to protect the aphids from which it is getting sugar. So oftentimes, if you are having an issue with lady, um, excuse me, with aphids, scale insects, white flies, and such, what you really need to do is to control ants so that your predators and parasitoids can get in there and do their work. So we'll take a look at Odonata. Odonata are the dragonflies and damselflies. And as far as I'm concerned, these are one of our unsung heroes. Um, they, are, they can eat their weight in mosquitoes daily. The larvae eat mosquito larvae. This here is a green darner. Dragonfly, Anax junius. It's easier to attract dragonflies to your garden because they will fly farther from water, but they are an excellent reason to put in a, a little pond or water feature. Make sure you have some emergent vegetation for the larvae to crawl out. And um, you may be able to hold an emergent dragonfly on your hand too one day. And the Orthoptera, this little grasshopper on the left, thought I wasn't going to spot them, but I did. And the Orthoptera are actually very good at disguising themselves because they are fantastic bird food. Um, on the right is a katydid, it's a nymph. And um, one interesting thing to know about um, the katydids is that a lot of them are actually omnivorous and they eat insect eggs in addition to nibbling on some leaves. Um, I haven't found them to be a problem. I know sometimes people get an overabundance of them in their gardens. And mantises. So these are not related to grasshoppers as we used to think, but actually more closely allied to cockroaches. Sorry about that. Um, and we do have native species in our gardens. Um, in most of the United States, you can find the Carolina mantis, Stagma mantis Carolina. And I do like to recommend that people not purchase the egg cases of the Chinese mantids, which are larger than our natives, and not only compete with them, but have been known to eat hummingbirds and um, even attack our own native mantises. So they are not desirable. And at any rate, mantises, you know, they eat the good bugs, they eat the bad bugs, they eat all the bugs. So they like to eat flower visitors. And um, so they're fun to watch, but there's really no reason to be purchasing them. And then we have lace wings. Check in my time. Um, so lace wings I mentioned are a good one to actually purchase and release in your garden. They will establish populations. They're nocturnal, the adults, so you may not even notice them. And the larvae eat a lot of aphids. The adults are flower feeders. And we have these green lace wings in the family Chrysopidae. These are the ones you have usually noticed. There's another family called brown lace wings, family Hemerobiidae, and they're smaller and less conspicuous. You may not have noticed them, but they are probably out there in your garden. So let's take a quick look at the ground crew and beyond. This is a jumping spider, Phytopus johnsonii. And um, 
so we're going to meet here just the myriad pods, the many footed and the spiders. There are some groups that are included in the book that I'm passing over in this section right now. Um, and I also want to bring up with the um, harvest men which you will see called daddy long legs. And these are not the house spiders that you find, but the critters that have one big round body part. And they are in the family of Pilionis. They have just one big round body part. They don't produce venom. They don't spin silk and they chew their prey up. And all of these things make them different than spiders, but desirable in our gardens. So myriapods includes the millipedes and the centipedes. Millipedes are vegetarians. They tend to be kind of slow moving. They have a rounder shape and um, they usually are, are functioning as detritivores and they're eating dead material and not creating issues. Occasionally you will find millipedes eating tender vegetation. Um, and the centipede here on the right is a hunting predator and it's flatter and it runs. And that is the easiest way to tell the difference is um, that it's behavioral. And this centipede actually has all its babies that are a little white here and that it's kind of curled around the babies there. <clears throat> so the centipedes sting, of course, the millipedes sometimes um, exude cyanide. And, and so I tend not to pick them up because they just smell. Um, but both of these things are found in any healthy garden and they need a damp environment to survive, which is why you find them under logs and such. So spiders, I cheated a bit here. This is a turret spider nest that I find out in the woods and they're fascinating and the females live in this little turret and they kind of pop out barely out of the opening and wait for prey to come by. And the males just run around in the forest looking, I guess, for turrets. Um, and um, the one on the right is a really beautiful crab spider. Crab spiders are on flowers. So of course they may eat pollinators, they may eat other insects that we don't want, um, but there they are. And they are never so abundant to worry about it because you will often see them eating bees. And then finally, the vertebrates. And um, the vertebrates need us to think about habitat in a different way because many of them really don't care about flowers. And so we have to think about things like water features, shelter, brush piles, rocks, logs, snags, um, and things like that. This is, by the way, a bush tit. So in the garden, if you're lucky, you may have some frogs or you may have some salamanders. And the salamanders are, by the way, amphibians and not related to lizards, which are uh, may look a bit similar, but are a reptile. Now out here on the West Coast where I am, we only have one turtle species, the Western pond turtle. And you're unlikely to actually find that in your garden. But I understand in some other parts of the country, it is more common to have a turtle in your garden. And some parts of the country have more lizards than others. Lizards are fantastic insectivores if you do have them in your garden. And finally, birds. Okay, so we already know we love birds. You can attract them to your garden by having um, different heights of vegetation, for instance and um, providing them with water. They like to have a nice open space where they can see around. They like ladders of vegetation where they can land high and come down into your garden. And I think we all welcome them. I like including thorny plants for nesting. So let's move on. What can you do in your garden to uh, garden sustainably? Well, one thing you can do is put up a bat house and um, bats um, eat lots and lots of mosquitoes. And so putting up a bat house is a fantastic idea. Plant native plants, plant other flowering plants that you uh, think are attracting and supporting pollinators and other beneficial insects. Be observant. So um, a lot of times people will tell you, oh, a hand lens. A hand lens is a great thing to have, certainly. And it's great for looking into the heart of flowers. And it's fantastic for looking at dead insects. 
But when things are flying about in your garden and you want to take a closer look, um, this is what I use. I'm going to hold them up here for a moment. Right there. Okay. These are a close focusing butterfly binoculars. They, these are made by Pentax and they're called Papilio and they are not terribly expensive. You can use them for bird watching as well. And um, I um, don't know how I ever lived without them. Excuse me. And one of the reasons to be observant is look at these are these are our walking sticks out in California here we have you know the longest coastline and the tallest trees and the biggest this and um, our, our walking sticks are really, really tiny though and hard to find and you can see if you're not observant in your garden how hard it can be to even notice things. Visit gardens, visit your friends' gardens, visit botanic gardens, every public space I'm in, I'm looking around. And I am often looking at flowers to see it, almost anything that flowers, if it's attracting a lot of insects to the flowers is a good thing for you to add to your garden. And that is going to vary regionally. Um, and I think I might've mentioned plant natives. Um, I love this garden on the right. Here's an oak tree. It dominates this yard and the owners planted everything else um, around this tree as native and to really nurture this tree. Um, and you know, there's 800 species at least of insects that feed on oak trees. And we really don't notice them. We notice the birds. So finally, we should be an example. Um, and the easiest place to do that is in our own gardens. But don't just go out in your backyard and plant things. Think about putting stuff in your front yard. And if you're worried that your neighbors are going to say, what happened to their lawn and those nice, tidy junipers, think about getting some signage. Um, there are a number of um, pollinator partnerships and Xerxes Society and Native Plant Societies that provide habitat signage for you to put in. This on the right here is actually a lizard and toad home. And I went to a garden where the gardener had all kinds of these little homes set up all over the place. And you could hear the frogs and the toads and the little lizards hanging out. Um, it was a lot of fun. And um, on the left, this was a bee haven garden that was specifically designed to support bees of all kinds. Water, water is so important in the garden. Um, and on the right, we have some drought tolerant plants and they're not native, but they are supporting um, hummingbirds, which love these red tubular flowers. Um, here's a front courtyard, all native plants. And on the right, we have an, a, a fairly new little orchard, but it's been underplanted with sweet alyssum and California poppies. And um, it looks like um, Gilia capitata there that is all going to attract beneficial insects that are gonna provide not only pollinator services, but predators and parasitoids to attack pests. You can be an example by being a master gardener. Um, and um, I, I'm happy to say that this is one of our largest volunteer organizations in the country um, and all across the country providing in valuable information for gardeners everywhere. Join iNaturalist. This photograph here, uh, which was taken by Bonnie Nickel is of a Northern plushback called Peta Vinatorum. It was way out of its normal range when she found it in San Diego. Um, she has posted over 4,000 photographs to all kinds of different projects. And th this is a great way to get your insects identified, by the way, is to join iNaturalist and you can post photographs of insects you find there and people will help you identify them. But I also use bugguide.org um, a lot. Join or volunteer at your local botanic garden, native plant society, school gardens are always in need of help. Turn off the lights. Um, so all of this lighting at night is really injurious to nocturnal organisms, be they birds or insects or other. And um, darksky.org is a great place to go for a little bit of additional information on that. 
of course, if um, here's the thing you could do is you could get my book. Um, and um, but I especially want to mention that um, I have a website coming online soon where I can expand on some of the topics in the book, um, put in the inevitable corrections and um, answer questions, put up a blog and uh, that ought to be up within a week or two. And finally, I want to leave you um, with this thought as you garden. And um, I hope that I um, have piqued your interest in exploring the possibilities <clears throat> of conservation biological control in your own garden. And thank you so much for listening today. Frederick, thank you. You've made a really strong case for slowing down a bit, sitting down, getting out your pair of binoculars, and just watching, observing. We are all asked very often, what can we do to promote uh, science with our students, with our children? Mm -hmm. And the number one thing we always say is, teach them how to observe. And you've done a great job of teaching us how to observe, so thank you. We have a couple questions. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I so appreciate what you've shared with us. You've made me calm down for the day, that's for sure. Oh, um, thank you. It is. And I think it's just perfect considering Halloween is coming up because it shows you that those creepy things that scare us on Halloween are really allies in our gardens. So thanks for that. And as someone just said, thank you for the inspiration. So oh, you did show your binoculars, and I'm not promoting one brand over the other, but I, is there a um, uh, field range? I'm trying to think of what it's called when you have the magnification. Oh, the six, six, let me see. Okay, so these come in two different, uh, I'm look, oh, here it is, 6.5 by 21. Um, but they, they make two different kinds. And the other one I think is 8.5 by 21. And they say the 8.5s are better if you want to do birds and butterflies. Great, excellent. I don't I, know who else makes close focusing binoculars right now. This is the so only close one. Close focusing is what close. we're looking for. Yes. Yeah. Close focusing. So yeah. that would be a great thing for everyone that's asked close focusing binoculars is what you want to ask for so that you can get a pair to be able to look at the birds that are flying by, but also those little creepy crawlers that are coming up close to you too. And then someone asked about mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. You haven't talked about the importance of beneficial fungi for garden health. Should we add mycorrhizal inoculants? And how do you ensure that it not only contains endomycorrhizal fungi, but also ectomycorrhizal <laughs> fungi? So I'm not sure if that's an area of expertise for you, but how do you answer that one? <laughs> um, a, a little bit. Um, and I do um, discuss them in the book. Generally speaking, unless your soil has been really damaged, say you moved into a brand new subdivision and they scraped all the topsoil away, in that case, you might want to add some mycorrhizae. But generally speaking, they are already there in your soil. And you know, mostly what I do with my soil is I add compost um, mm -hmm. and I add it to the top and I let the worms and other creatures mix it in. And um, <clears throat> I really have not, had a need to add anything in my own garden. Um, sometimes it's good in potted plants where you have, you know, artificial soil mixes. But um, I, but I do want to say yes to the questioner. They are extremely important, and most of our plants have an association with mycorrhizae and cannot be healthy without them. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing was, we've been doing what funny, interesting thing was, we've been doing a soil survey project here at the Smithsonian, and mm -hmm. some of our poorest soils actually had the most mycorrhizal fungi in them because uh -huh. the plants are relying on the fungi to keep them alive and healthy. So okay. it actually is something they never have seen before, uh -huh. uh, but it, it's, it's, it's something that it occurs. So now they're going to investigate it more and see how it really, the presence, we already know it helps the plants, but why right. are the poor soils so heavy with right. fungi? Um, 
It's it fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm trying to remember now, for, I think it was Da Vinci who said, you know, we know more about the planets in the air than we do about the soil underfoot. It's still true. And, you know, when I started out in my career, nobody spoke about Michael Ricey. I don't, I don't think we even knew about them really. I don't think so either. You know? yeah. And, and um, so we're always discovering new things and there is a world of discovery right under our feet still. So I'm going to recommend people that have more questions mm -hmm. to please wait to Frederic opens her website and then you'll be able to contact her and yes. ask her many more questions. Yes. I think that's terrific. And, and um, people are welcome to email me if they want to. And, that's uh, terrific. And, and as long as they know, I may not answer instantly, but I will. <laughs> I love that. Well, it is one o'clock and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Frederic, for such great information. And I look forward to visiting you again soon, hopefully, um, so that I can hear more about your exp escapades out in the garden and who you have visiting you now. Thanks to everyone. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.